what I want to do today is reflect on where we are with the early childhood field in the broadest sense. ISA is at a turning point. Step by step is at a turning point. This is an important anniversary. And we can always say that any year is a turning point because, of course, it is. And I think it's a, but I think it's a healthy thing for us to use this conference to say, OK, we got to 2014. How has it been? What have we achieved? And how is it going to be different for the next stage? And the three strands of this conference are built around the idea of revisioning early childhood services for the next phase. <coughs> I want to reflect on just some of those themes today, mostly just asking questions and raising possibilities for you to think about in relation to the future of early childhood, the future of ISSA, and the future of your own work. So, we have a number of anniversaries. I was very pleased that Regina, your president, in opening this conference, drew attention to the third anniversary, the anniversary, 25th anniversary, of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Because I believe that it's probably one of the more important underpinning elements of all the work we do which, since 1919, has given a new edge, a new political and, and legal edge to the work we do on behalf of children. I think we're at a tipping point globally in the early childhood world. And for just one moment, I want to step outside this particular audience and your particular interests. Most of my work these days is actually not within Europe, but is further afield. And I think globally we are at a tipping point in terms of recognition and understanding about early childhood. We've now got a very strong research base, a very strong evidence base, numerous studies, both fundamental studies about human development as well as evaluation studies about programs and so on and so on that give us a very strong basis for advocating for early childhood in global policy terms. We've also got these growing networks of which ISSA is one, and the networks of professionals, researchers, advocates are really fundamental to building this movement globally. Consequently, as Sarah mentioned, there's been a drive that in the post-2015 goals globally, early childhood development should be central. Now, it's interesting to reflect for a moment that the Millennium Development Goals that we're just coming to the end of, that ran from 2000 to 2015, the Millennium Development Goals do, do not directly connect to children, to young children. But actually, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, they are all about young children. They just aren't expressed in that language. They're about, of course, infant mortality. They're about maternal health. They're about gender issues. They're about education. You can't go very far in articulating those goals without getting to questions about early childhood. And there's a strong movement to try to bring early childhood central to the post-2015 goals. And if that were to be achieved, or let's be honest, even if we just get a little step on the direction, what a huge advance that would be for the field of early childhood, which I began my involvement with about 40 years ago when early childhood was a rather minority esoteric interest of a few advocates and practitioners and people who ran kindergartens and preschools. And it certainly didn't have center stage in policy. Now we've moved a long way. The question is, how ambitious are we going to be? How ambitious are we for this field? How far are we willing to go in saying that really through the work that is done around young children, around parents, around families and communities, 
the world can be changed to a better place. So I'm going to talk about our four themes that collect cl closely to the strands of the conference. A rights-based vision, a life course vision, a holistic and comprehensive vision, and an equitable and inclusive vision. I am going to think grand, as you gather. I'm going to propose we think grand. Through the course of this meeting, you can get practical and real and critical and wonder what actually can be done. But we have to start with a big vision. So I'm going to start by thinking about a rights-based vision. And I make no apologies for putting rights up front. We are now in a phase where we have any number of different discourses around the young child to draw on. So we've got all the evidence from human development research, from neuroscience, about early childhood as a critical period. We've got all the evidence on what, how quality programs can make a difference. We've got all the evidence around how early childhood programs can increase social justice, equity, and inclusion. We've got all the work around empowering parents and communities that Step by Step is so, so featured on. And we've also got this other area I'm going to say a few more words about, which is about recognizing the power of early childhood programs in delivering on children's developmental potential, or in the language of economists, of investing in human capital. But I've put rights of the child at the center, because I do believe that respect for the rights of the child should be and needs to be the foundation principle for the way we work in this field. And I'll just take a short diversion to explain why I think the rights of the child should be central. Many of you will know of the uh, famous um, Nobel Prize winning economist, James Heckman, who has done some really wonderful work. And I want to emphasize in all I'm about to say, I'm not myself critical of Heckman. It's about positioning this field of work. Has done wonderful work reinterpreting the evidence of the longitudinal outcomes from early childhood programs in, an eco in economic analyses. And this is a quote from Heckman, where he says, why should society invest in young children? The traditional argument is fairness and social justice. There is another argument, economic efficiency. The gains from investment can be quantified, and they're large. And Heckman bases this argument on his analysis of, of evidence. And that's where this chart comes from, to argue that the returns on early childhood programs are much greater in terms of productivity in the labor market later on in life than from later interventions. That's why up here is so high. Programs targeted toward the early years, the rate of return on investment, etc., etc., and it declines down. Now, he's not made this chart up. This is based on data, and it's very powerful. But I do think we have to think about the implications of this approach. It has its place in any of our stories around early childhood, in the arguments we make for it, in the vision we have for it, but it must not be central. The reason is because investment cannot be, the, in, the investment potential, the human capital potential, cannot only be the reason for the work we do. Maybe at this point I'll quote from the Polish educator and doctor Janusz Kuszak, who died in the Holocaust in 1942. He said, children are not the people of tomorrow, but people today. And that is the risk of so much of the discourse around early childhood that we probably use in making good arguments, but actually in our hearts we know isn't really the way forward. That we need to base what we do on a respect for the child now, on an understanding 
that children are the people, are not the people of tomorrow, but people today. So there are dangers of viewing early childhood pro programs in an instrumental way. Children aren't just developmental potential. Yes, they are developmental potential, but they're not just developmental potential. And in framing policies and programs, that should not be the priority concern. Young children are not an investment opportunity. There is a very good case for investing in young children, but that's a very different thing from seeing them as human capital. Now, that may seem a very subtle distinction, but I think it's fundamental and justifies why we put the rights of the child at the centre, because the rights of the child are about the child now as much as anything. There's another reason why an investment human capital view of the arguments for early childhood is risky. And that is, returns on investment don't apply equally to all children. So if you take the argument to its extreme, there is a risk you become divisive. Not all children are going to bring a return to society economically from the investment. Disabled children especially are less likely to give you a return. And after all, in other areas of life, we don't use this argument. As I approach the age of 65, I'm acutely aware that I hope that elderly services in the UK will not be based on an, a human capital model. <laughs> I don't need to say any more. In framing what we do with a core respect for children's rights in the agenda, on the agenda, we have help. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the UN Convention, just 10 years ago, that's another anniversary, had a day of discussion where they looked specifically at early childhood. And they were worried. They were worried because they noticed that in states' parties, as in governments, in governments' reports to the UN Committee on progress and implementation, young children were being neglected. And as a result of that, the UN Committee prepared what they call a general comment. There are a whole series of these general comments linked to the UN Convention. General comment number seven, which was published in 2005, is specifically on rights in early childhood. I believe it's been used quite extensively as a tool for clarifying on what, how rights apply to young children. And I do believe it has, hopefully, a useful place in your work too. So, in that document, the UN Committee reasserted that states' parties have not given sufficient attention to young children as rights holders and to the laws, policies, and program required to realize their rights. The general comment, like the UN Convention, of course, covers all aspects of rights, but particularly significant uh, is the way the general comment reasserts a shifting image of the child as an active participant. That children, including the very youngest children, should be respected as persons in their own right, as active members of families, communities, and societies with their own concerns, interests, and points of view. That's very relevant to what Step by Step is about and what ISSA is about. So when we think about the work of ISSA, it's not about so much about children 
learning to be citizens in a democracy, but it's rather recognizing that children are citizens in a democracy and helping them learn through participating in that democracy. So again, the general comment talks about the many respects in which children's rights to express their views and feelings should be anchored in their daily life, etc. I need to move on. What I want to emphasize as well in all of this is the point that there is a risk that young children are positioned in a very particular way in the way the adult world talks about them. They're positioned as vulnerable, needy, need of protection, need of care, and need of nurture, and that the adult world, the world of parents and carers and teachers and so on, is positioned as providing, as protecting, and so on. Now, very often that is the case, and I'm not pretending otherwise. But I think it's quite useful to shake up that stereotype image in a way which recognizes that children are also strong, children contribute, children have agency, children have views and feelings which they want to express, children themselves want to change the world. And I don't mean by that in a naive way they should be just allowed to change the world or allowed to make chaos in the nursery or whatever it is, but respecting their position as human beings, as young citizens, is important equally well as recognizing the vulnerabilities and limitations of the adult world. Which, of course, is a dynamic in all practices, in all programs with children. It's a dynamic on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just about individual differences between children, which go on top of ethnic differences, cultural differences, language differences, gender differences, and all the other things we're concerned about in inclusion. I'd want to extend the concept of inclusion to acknowledge minute by minute and hour by hour the dynamics of the relationship between what the children bring to a, an early childhood program and what the adults bring shifts. Let me move on to my second theme, a life course vision. So what is this field of early childhood? When I began, early childhood generally meant preschool, meant the period just before school, with a bit of concern about daycare for younger children in policy language, but mostly it was about preschool. The vision of early childhood has grown in terms of the age span that it covers. General Comment 7, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, give a working, de of working definition of early childhood as below the age of eight. So that's already a big span, right from around birth to eight years old. That covers a huge field of young children's lives and parents' lives and program opportunities. From the tiniest infant through to the school child is encompassed in that definition. And there are numerous services and entry points for intervening in children's lives during that period. But arguably, the definition of early childhood needs to be more extended than that. There was a technical reason why the UN Committee did not, uh, sorry, put it the other way. There was a technical reason why the UN Committee defined early childhood as below the age of eight. They didn't want to specify a start point for early childhood because it's a highly controversial issue for, for different member states of the UN around before, the f before birth period in terms of the rights of the infant. So they said under the age of late eight and left it open. But of course there are other advocacy movements and research movements that argue we've got to go a lot earlier than below the age of eight into the period before the child is born 
as all relevant to thinking about early childhood. After all, in some ways, the birth event, though it's huge, is kind of arbitrary. It's kind of one important marker in the growth process that begins with conception. So is the early childhood field willing and ready to embrace a vision of early childhood that starts from conception? That doesn't mean, of course, that everybody should be trying to work on the whole area. It's that vision of development from conception onwards. There's so, so many opportunities within the first thousand days, as a, you, I expect you're very familiar with this phrase, the first thousand days from conception to the second birthday, approximately a thousand days, which is arguably the most critical period in the child's life. You could even take it further, you know. There is increasingly research. I'm looking at research which is talking about the critical period around the, con around the conception of the infant. That's a critical period affecting the mother-to-be. I'm thinking particularly in developing countries where the nutritional status the amount of food available and the quality of food available to the mother before they conceive is being demonstrated to have a direct effect on fetal development. That is why I argue we should be thinking in a life course frame. And I note in passing that general comment seven in that general comment, the UN committee interprets the right to education as beginning at birth for all children without discrimination of any kind. So we have there quite a, a good starting point for mapping out a vision of early childhood education for the full age span. Those of you who heard me talk in the last few years will have heard me say this. I think it's time the early childhood community grew up and asserted ourselves. Early childhood is not just this little phase of life before the important stuff happens at school. Early childhood, measured in terms of age span alone, is the first half of childhood. The first half of childhood. It's not a little backwater before the important things happen at school. In terms of age span, it's the first half. Developmentally, arguing, arguably, it's a hugely more than the first half of childhood because of so much that is determined in that period. I think there's value in asserting that principle. I'm going to move on now to my third theme which is one of the themes that is central to this conference, about a holistic and comprehensive vision. Being holistic is one of the signature characteristics of early childhood programs. Right from the pioneers, the idea of being holistic has been so important, in part as a reaction to the narrowing of children's development in school systems, which were so often built around very, very limited objectives for children's learning and development. So here's the ISA pedagogical principles, elaborating on what we mean by that holistic principle at a program level. And then I put alongside another one just to show a similar example from Te Fariki in New Zealand. So what does it mean to be holistic? Actually, I think it's a huge challenge to be holistic. It's a word that comes very easily off the tongue, but is much more difficult to implement in practice. Within, step by step, within the ISSA community, there is a strong 
uh, a strong emphasis on being holistic and a great deal is achieved. But actually being holistic involves a lot more than this. And one of the themes of this conference is to think big time about holistic. And by big time, I mean again beyond the doors of the preschool. Because in some senses, it's all very well being holistic with children within the confines of the preschool. But wait a minute, their lives don't just happen in the preschool. Their lives happen in the community, in families. They connect with any number of different agencies and services. How do we achieve a holistic uh, approach which spans all of that? Every country is different. Every municipality is different. But in general, there are different sectors. Historically, they've grown up. The different sectors here that affect impact on young children. And in general, they're often very fragmented and uncoordinated, to various degrees uncoordinated uh, systems. This is, of course, inefficient. It's confusing for parents and children. And it can put children at risk where children fall down the gaps between services. So how do we do better in this area? Well, a few things we need to be clear about from the beginning. First of all, this is not a new problem, nor is it unique to early childhood. Virtually every area of public services worries about how to be comprehensive and more integrated, how to be more joined up. When I first started work on early childhood policy, it was with the Council of Europe project in the 1970s. And this issue was central then for Europe. And at that time, there'd been some quite interesting experiments. Of course, we'd already had Head Start in the USA, which was trying to do integrated programming. In Sweden, they had a single ministry responsible for the early childhood field. I remember well visiting in the UK uh, a program called the Children's House up in Crewe in Cheshire, which had been established to try to bring services under one roof. And of course, it's not just Europe and the US. The India, in India, the Integrated Child Development Services was introduced as way back to 1975. And the examples of attempts towards integration are very widespread. <coughs> We've had Sure Start in the UK. We've got Hungary's version of Sure Start. So the question arises, how successful are these approaches? And what is the, the best way forward? Well, I'm not going to answer that in the few minutes I've got available. But I want to open up a few questions. Let me start by offering you, I know you can't read the detail, but just let me tell you what this is. This is a mapping of different services across different sectors across the full age span. It comes from Pierre Brito and colleagues, and Pierre is now the, uh, the early childhood uh, expert advisor in New York for UNICEF. But it's quite salutary because it shows you, even if you can't read the detail, just how many different things there are there. And how do you get them to fit together? Well, once again, there's a useful tool in the words of the general comment in saying the rights of the child can only be implemented in a holistic manner. And then the, the, the general comment lists all the, the sectors that need to be brought together. But the question is how to do it and how to think about a comprehensive approach or a more integrated approach or a more joined up approach. I, I, I've done a bit of work on this in the last few months for another, for another activity. And I devised one evening when I had a spare moment, I devised this stepladder of integration. I was quite pleased with it by the end of the evening. So, at the bottom, you've got complete fragmentation as the bottom rung of the ladder. Then you've got sector-based services that are working reasonably effectively, but with minimal connection. 
Then you've got more coordination in terms of roles, goals, and delivery. Then you've got sectoral collaboration, maybe via shared training schemes. Then you've got what I call partial integration via joint policies and combined services, maybe like Head Start or Sure Start at different levels in, in administration. And then what you've got at the top, full integration. So by 10 o'clock in the evening, I was rather pleased with myself. But when I looked again in the morning, I thought, no, this is rubbish. This just is not the way to think about it. It's a start. But actually, of course, for a number of reasons, we've got to be a bit more sophisticated about the way we think about this thing. First of all, there is a question mark about, in my mind about what the goal should be for comprehensive services. There is certainly a pressure and a movement towards greater integration. That means all coming under one ministry, or all housed within one building, or a common training, like the Scandinavians have the social pedagogue training system. Is that necessarily the best way forward? I'm not sure. I've just put it to you as a question. Some degrees of joined up is, of course, a good thing. But I think there are several reasons why full integration may be very difficult to achieve. First of all, we're not dealing with a ladder. That simply is no good. If I gave that to my professor, he should put a cross through it and say, no, think more sophisticated. We've got to think multidimensionally because we've got to think at the level of policy and ministry organization. We've got to think about finance and governance. We've got to think about professionalism and professional training. We've got to think about service delivery in terms of home visiting or centers. Actually, this is a huge thing. And one little chart won't deliver on it. Maybe by the end of the week, you'll come up with a better one. I'll be pleased to give it 10 out of 10 if you do. There is another reason why we have to be a bit careful, which is, whoops, which is down at the bottom here. We don't want to, rev in our aims to achieve integration and comprehensiveness, we don't want to create a monolith. That, in a sense, goes right against the principles of open society. Where's the scope for innovation? Where's the scope for the NGO or the community leader or even just the mom or the dad to say, I've got this little group going in my village and we're doing really great things. That's not going to be integrated very easily. But we want diversity. We want innovation. We want the technology to work. I'll get a spanner later and sort it out. So I think that's really, that's really quite a big challenge for the conference, to work through within the values of ISSA and the values of open society, what do we mean by being comprehensive? Finally, my fourth heading, an equitable and inclusive vision. You'll be glad to know I'm going to spend least time on this because two reasons. I've run out of time. And secondly, because there are many people in this room with huge expertise on what it means to be inclusive in early childhood services. I think actually in the concept of being inclusive covers almost everything I've talked about so far. It means being inclusive in respect not only to the usual suspects of gender, ethnicity, language, disability. It means being inclusive in the more fundamental sense of accepting every child and every parent and indeed every teacher as they are on a Monday morning and whatever is happening and trying to build a community that works for all those people. No more from me about inclusive. But I do care passionately, passionately about the issue of equity. And I don't have time to go into detail about it. I'm not going to, I don't want to end on a negative note, but it is the big challenge. 
there is a huge lot being said about the potential of early childhood services right now. And one of the main arguments is about the potential of early childhood services in respect for marginalized, disadvantaged groups living in poverty. But before we can deliver on that promise, we have to improve the way services are delivered in a way that, at the very least, gives those communities access. Now, there are many, many projects in many countries that you work in and many around the world that do wonderful work in bringing disadvantaged groups into early childhood services. But if you look at the big picture, I'm sorry, we are failing abysmally. Let's just use the indicator of poverty. So this is taken from UNICEF data. It's global data. It's about the percentage of and three and four year olds attending preschool. So you can see the regional differences. Central and Eastern Europe, South Asia, East Asia, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, and so on. But more significant for me is to look at the differentiated colors. It's because it's differentiated by income of the children's families. So what you see is that in almost every case, it's the most advantaged children that are most represented in preschool. The least advantaged children who are least represented, I can't do it, sorry, in preschool. That is a huge challenge for every country and every community. And without improving access, improving equity, all our grand visions for how early childhood programs can change the world, build democracy, build inclusion, they're worth very little. Now, I know that many people in this room would say, I'm not in a position to do very much, but we do have to advocate very strongly for uh, a more uh, positive, purposeful, targeted program development and uh, uh, service development on those groups. One particular area I'm not going to talk about because I'm out of time that I'm very concerned about is the growth of private for profit sector, which is accounting for quite a lot of the services for the more privileged groups and quite a lot of poor families as well, especially in countries which have weak uh, systems. This is a big problem to be addressed. So, there's a challenge ahead. There's lots to be positive about, about 2014. This is, after all, a celebration of anniversaries, but there's a great deal to be done. Globally, there's lots and lots of crises affecting children in a very negative way that we need to be aware of, and some may impinge on your work. Each country's in a very different place. The vision that we're going to explore in this meeting will affect everybody in a different way, but we all have a contribution to make, not least with some really good discussion that I'm looking forward to.